This morning, I will be reading from 2 Samuel, starting uh, with chapter 18, verse 19, and we're going up to chapter 19, verse 8. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, Please let me run and bring the king news that the Lord has freed him from the hand of his enemies. But Joab said to him, You are not the man to bring news this day, but you shall bring news another day. However, you shall bring no news this day, because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, Go, tell the king what you have seen. So the Cushite bowed to Joab and ran. However, Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said once more to Joab, But whatever happens, please let me also run after the Cushite. And Joab said, Why would you run, my son, since you will have no messenger's reward for going? But whatever happens, he said, I will run. So he said to him, Run. Then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and passed by the Cushite. Now David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went to the roof of the gate by the wall and raised his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was running by himself. So the watchman called out and told the king, and the king said, If he is by himself, there is good news in his mouth. And he came nearer and nearer. Then the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to the gatekeeper and said, Behold, another man is running by himself. And the king said, This one also is bringing good news. The watchman said, I think the running form of the first one is like the running form of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, This is a good man, and he is coming with good news. Then Ahimaaz called out to the king and said, All is well. And he prostrated himself before the king with his face to the ground. And he said, Blessed is the Lord your God who has turned over the men who raised their hands against my lord the king. But the king said, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And Ahimaaz answered, When Joab said the king's servant and your servant, I, I saw a great uh, commotion, but I did not know what it was. Then the king said, Turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. Then behold, the Cushite arrived, and the Cushite said, Let my lord the king receive good news, for the Lord has freed you this day from the hand of those who rose up against you. Then the king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all those who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. Then the king trembled and went to the chamber over the gate and wept. And this is what he said as he walked. My son, Epsilon, my son, my son, Epsilon, if only I had died instead of you, Epsilon, my son, my son. Then it was reported to Joab, Behold, the king is weeping, and he mourns for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people, because the people heard it said that day, The king is in mourning over his son. And the people entered the city surreptitiously that day, just as people who are humiliated surreptitiously flee in battle. And the king covered his face, and cried out with a loud voice, My son, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son! Then Joab came into the house, and he said to the king, Today you have shamed all your servants who have saved your life, and the lives of your sons and daughters, and the lives of your wives, and the lives of your concubines, by loving those who hate you, and by hating those who love you. For you have revealed today that commanders and servants are nothing to you. For I know today that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then it would be right as far as you are concerned. Now therefore arise and go out and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, 
no man will stay the night with you, and this will be worse for you than all the misfortune that has happened to you from your youth until now. So the king got up and sat by the gate. When they told all the people, saying, Behold, the king is sitting at the gate, then all the people came before the king. Thank you, Chuck, for reading so dramatically that passage. And it is quite the dramatic passage. A uh, passage of scripture that I believe has inspired poets and artists and writers throughout the ages ever since the, the, the power of David's grief expressed in those moments, uh, a turning point in his life, of course. Now, in the story, The um, Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis, uh, if you haven't read that book, then by the time I finish sharing this illustration again, you might be quite familiar with it. Uh, one of the most kind of important scenes in the story is, is about a boy named Eustace. You're familiar with, with this? His, his name was Eustace, and I like how C.S. Lewis says, and he almost deserved that name. <laughs> you know, he's a really rotten kid, just awful. He was really mean and cruel, but he got sucked into the land of Narnia with, with his uh, cousins. And while he was there, he was cut off from his group, and he ended up taking shelter in a, uh, a dragon's cave, only to wake up and discover that he himself had turned into a dragon. Well, he was already bad before, but now he showed what he was really like. And uh, finally, I'm going to fast forward he encounters Aslan, you know, Aslan the lion, who in the story you could say is a representation of Jesus in the land of Narnia. Because when he encounters Aslan, Aslan helps him to remove the dragon skin. But it's a painful experience. He goes down to the lake, and Aslan says, are you ready for me to take the skin off? And with his sharp claws, he rips the dragon flesh off of, off of Eustace, and it hurts. Then he pushes him in the lake to wash off, and it hurts even more, and then he gets up and realizes, I still have a lot of layers of dragon skin. And so over and over, Aslan tears the dragon skin off of Eustace, until finally he is down to the boy that he's supposed to be, uh, and he has that dragon skin torn away. Painful experience and a repetitive experience. And, you know, how much do we sometimes resist letting God remove the things in our lives that are keeping us from being where he wants us to be, that are keeping us from experiencing the promises that he has for us? We have our own dragon skins that we, you know, are all too comfortable fitting into. And we need the Lord to come and tear that away, to remove us from uh, that, but it's difficult and it's hard, uh, but God wants to do that in our lives. And so I feel like in this passage, this is probably the most painful moment in King David's life as he is forced to lose what he cannot bear to lose. But the question is, could it be that in this moment of his greatest pain, it's exactly where God needs to take him in order for him to really experience what God's promises are for him, right? To experience, his God, experience God's faithfulness. And since that's the theme of our whole uh, look at the book of 2 Samuel, that we hold on to God's promises because the king is coming, the question is, how do we hold on to God's promises, especially when it feels like we've just lost everything, even if it feels like God has torn everything away from us? Could it be that our greatest loss might be a moment of our greatest gain? It doesn't seem like it makes any sense. But this is what I think we're looking at in this passage. So yes, we do need to hold on to God's promises. God has good news. We, we heard that today in Isaiah. There's good news. Lift up your voice. There's good news. Uh, but also we need to receive that good news of God's promise, even when it feels like bad news. So before we get into the text, let me please pray. Father, we come to you and we open your word, and we thank you, God, that this is your inspired word. Your spirit speaks into it, spoke to and through those who wrote it down for us and have 
kept it and preserved it and, and until this day. And so we look into your word, and God, you are speaking to us. Uh, so as we called out to you earlier, now you call back through your word. And so we pray that as we look in your word, you would speak to our hearts uh, to do all those things you promised, to comfort, uh, to strengthen, but Lord, also to challenge and to shape, and if necessary, to tear away what isn't what you want for us, God, so that we might know what is the good news that you have for us. We just pray this, that you would uh, speak in and through this time in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, let's begin looking at this text again and asking uh, what is being given to David here. Uh, Let's look back first of all, right, in case you missed the last few weeks. uh, What has transpired so far? Well, Absalom, David's son, uh, after some drama with his own siblings, uh, he murdered his brother Amnon because Amnon had raped his sister, David's daughter Tamar. So Absalom killed Amnon. Absalom fled Jerusalem. Absalom returned. Absalom was sort of cut off from his father, but finally Absalom... uh, Grew a rebellion against his father. So much so that David fled Jerusalem to Machanaim, which is uh, across the Jordan River. I won't have any slides for you today, so you have to remember the maps. But uh, Absalom then entered Jerusalem, took the city. After a delay, thankfully, because Hushai, David's counselor, was a, was a counter spy there. Uh, telling Absalom to not rush it, don't go out against him right away. And because of that delay, David uh, had the chance to meet Absalom. Instead of on the run, he met him in the forest of Ephraim, uh, where the battle transpired. And that was what we read last week. And remember, Absalom, his magnificent head of hair, was caught, entangled in a great oak. And it was there as his mule, his royal mule, passed out from under him that he le- was left hanging where Joab found him, and Joab and his ten servants killed him, threw his body into a pit, covered him with a heap, a great heap of stones. Well, that's the battle. It's been won, right? The enemy has been defeated, and so that's good news. This great rebellion has been overthrown. The the rebellion that threatened David's life, David's kingdom, you could even say it threatened God's promises for David and his, his future, and God has given him the victory. So the, now the next step is, let's tell David, right? Send him the news. So Joab, actually before Joab even asks, what happens? We see Ahimaaz, or Ahimaaz, I don't know how you pronounce it, Ahimaaz, if you want to know the Hebrew, uh, is the one to come forward. Look at in verse uh, 19. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, please let me run and bring the king news that the Lord has freed him from the hand of his enemies. So again, before Joab even asks, who should I send? He's right there, and he wants to be the one to bring this good news. There's a couple of important words that we see repeated over and over in this passage. One of them is to run, roots, okay, is the Hebrew word to run, and it comes up 12 times in these verses because that's what the messenger does. They run. They go from the location of the news to the one who needs to hear the news. Uh, But a more important word even in here, we hear over and over again, is the Hebrew word basar. And that's a verb that means to bring or to deliver news. Uh, In fact, it's usually almost always uh, in reference to good news, not just any information, but the good news, usually a victory, right? And so we hear uh, that there is a message of good news. In fact, the noun of that verb is besorah, which means good news. And we hear that many times in the scripture, but many, many times in this passage. But Joab, as we saw, doesn't want to send Ahimaaz, son of Zadok, David. You know, David's faithful priest uh, was Zadok, and this is his son. And I think Joab's thinking, well, this is not such a good time to bring news to King David. You shouldn't be the messenger at this time, right? And why is that? Because the king's son is dead. I don't think he's going to love that news. Uh, And it's, we read in in verse 20, uh, Joab said, you are not the man to carry news this day, but you shall carry news another day. However, you shall carry no news today because the king's son is dead. Later on, he, he, he tries to help 
ahimaasida, he's not going to get a reward in verse 22. There's going to be no reward for going. You know, sometimes a good news bringer could expect a reward for bringing the good news. Uh, this news, though, he's pretty much telling him is not going to be good. David doesn't want to hear that his son is dead. The last thing he told us when we left was, make sure no harm comes to the boy, to my son, to Absalom. And now his son is dead. So instead, he thinks, I need to send somebody else. And do um, you know what? You remember watching the old Star Trek uh, TV series, right, with, uh, with Captain James T. Kirk and Mr. Spock? And, you know, when, when Spock and Kirk and Dr. McCoy would ever be beamed down to a planet, uh, they would always have one extra guy from the ship go down with them, right? Some guy who wasn't a main character. And you wonder, who's that guy, and why is he going down to the planet with them? Well, and it always turned out that there was some alien, and one of them had to be killed. Thankfully, it would always be the extra guy and not the main character. And I think Joab's saying, listen, if you're going to tell David bad news, do you remember what he did to some of the other guys who came with bad news? Do you remember chapter 1 when the, uh, the Amalekite said, Saul and Jonathan, your enemies are dead. And by the way, I helped to do it. And he's like, oh, you want a reward for that? I'll give you a reward. And he killed the guy. Uh, later on in chapter 4, the, the sons of Ramon, who killed uh, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, came to David and said, hey, look, your enemy's dead, and we helped you do it. And he's like, oh, I'll give you a reward for that too. Boom, killed the two of them. So David didn't take too kindly to bad news bringers. And so he's like, maybe you don't want to be that guy who brings David this message today. Uh, um, hey, let's get this extra. <laughs> this Kushite, he's not even an Israelite, right? He's a foreigner, and we'll send him and see how it goes. Uh, so, so the Kushite, of course, takes the message and runs. But Ahimaaz is just like, no, I got to go. I, he's persistent. I don't think he's looking for a reward, though, right? Who is Ahimaaz? Remember, the son of the priest this was one of the inner circle of David's spies in Jerusalem who were getting him information so that he would not be overthrown by Absalom. And, and Ahimaaz was one of the priest's sons who ran and took the message to David in the first place to find a safe place to go and to prepare for this battle. So perhaps he's thinking, look, I'm invested in this and I'd like to also be the one who can be part of telling David this wonderful news that, that God has you know, delivered him. What a historic moment. So whatever happens, he says, come what may, I want to be there uh, when David hears this good news. So he runs. Uh, he says, let me go. Joab says, fine, go. And he ran, and it says in verse uh, 23, uh, he ran by the way of the plain, and he passed up the Cushite. Now, some scholars uh, believe that when the uh, you know, if this is Machanayim on the Jabbok River, I don't have a slide, so I'll just see my fingers here, uh, and the Jordan River flowing down here, and this is the forest of, of, uh, of Ephraim. Well, it's a pretty rough terrain, so if the Cushite is taking this route, it might be a shorter distance, but a harder way to go, and it looks as though Ahimaaz takes the broader plain along the river and back up uh, the Jabbok to get to Machanayim. So even though it might be a little bit longer, he could get there more swiftly, and he does. He arrives before the Cushite. Well, that's the first part of getting the message to David. It's just who to send. <laughs> but the next part is the camera shifts, you could say. Uh, the scene shifts to where David is located, and you see how he's waiting desperately to hear good news. He, he wants good news as well. So there's not only those being sent with the message, but there's those who need to hear it. And in this case, it's David. And from his point of view, we see in verse 24, David is sitting between the two gates. Uh, remember, of course, that's where he left them when they, when they went out to battle. When they said, no, David, you don't come with us. You stay in the city. He didn't really go into the city. He waited at the gates. He's, he's kind of yearning, his heart stretching out to his people to find out, will there be news of victory? And in fact, the word sitting in Hebrew is yoshev, which means to dwell. We hear later on that he goes up to his room, right? He probably had a room above the gate where he was staying and living uh, and waiting in that place. This is obviously a very important part of the, of the story, this location of this gate. And it's from here that he waits for news of the battle. It kind of echoes a little bit if you go back to the earlier part of 1 Samuel, where Eli, the priest, was waiting for news of his sons who went out to battle. 
who took the Ark of the Covenant, right? And he's sitting uh, on his chair, and in the Septuagint actually says sitting by the gate as he waits for the news to come. And when the news comes, remember that scene too. Not good news for Eli. Um, I'm not saying it's a perfect parallel, but I think there's echoes of that. And so we know that there's this hope for news, and what kind of news will it be when it comes to David? And I love the uh, kind of the, the imagery here. You have different people in the gate. You have the watchman up on the wall. You have the gatekeeper out in front. You have David waiting inside. And the watchman up there uh, is kind of David's eyes seeing at a distance and then conveying the information down to David and David hearing it and kind of translating it in his head. Like, I kind of wonder if that's, that, that must be good news, right? There's this long kind of drawn out drama about just, just the waiting for the good news which really builds the, the suspense of the story as well as the drama. There's this slow uh, transmission of information, and David's just desperate as he waits, as he looks. Uh, now David, verse 24, just reading it now in light of what we said, David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the wall and raised his eyes and looked, and behold, a man running by himself. The watchman called and told the king, and the king said, if he's by himself, there's good news in his mouth. And he came nearer and nearer. Then the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to the gatekeeper and said, Behold, another man running by himself. And the king said, This one is also bringing good news. David, I think, knows that uh, if there's more than one man, this probably means people are fleeing from the battle. But if there's just a messenger, he's coming alone usually, and he must come with good news. And I think David's thinking, I need the good news. Now, what was David's hope that the good news would be? He needed victory, and somehow he also wanted his son Absalom to be alive. To him, that would be really good news. So that, I think, is what somehow he's hoping against hope to hear. Finally, they recognize Ahimaaz, right? He's been one of David's messengers before, so I think they recognize his running as he approaches. I love it how he says, he's a good man, so he must come with good news. And then we get to the part which is not just uh, the sending of the news and the waiting for the news, but finally the telling of the news uh, in verse 28. Achimahaz calls out, and in English we have all as well. The Hebrew word is shalom. Shalom, what a great word, right? Of peace, of well-being, of success, of, of wellness. And also echoes the name of shalom, Absalom. So maybe David's thinking, yes, shalom, af shalom. And so he arrives, and I love also how when he arrives, bows himself before the king, he starts praising the Lord. He sings a song of praise. It sounds like you could think of David's own psalms where he praises God for his victory. He says, Baruch Adonai Elohecha, blessed is the Lord your God, who's delivered up the men who lifted up their hand against the, my lord the king. Now, you would think with that great news, right? David would be praising the Lord along with Ahimaaz. But what is David's response in verse 29? Well, it's a little baffling. Uh, because instead of saying hallelujah, he says, yeah, 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 but what about the shalom, the well-being of the young man in the Hebrew, na'ar, Absalom. A na'ar, by the way, is a word in used in a variety of places in Hebrew, and it can mean a young man, it can sometimes even mean a servant or a soldier, but it also means you're a little boy. You know, a na'ar is your child, your son. It's this expression of fatherly affection, and even as they left to go to battle, he said, look out, you know, deal gently with na'ar, the young man, Absalom. Uh, and so I think this response is a little bit baffling for Ahimaaz, because He's like, well, what do I say to that? Uh, that's not the, you know, the, the re reception I thought I was going to get for bringing this great news. So even in his answer, Ahimaaz kind of stumbles over what to say. In verse 29, uh, he, he, he says, When Joab sent the king, your servant, and your servant, uh, I saw a great tumult, but I did not know what, what it was. And it, you can, it sounds weird in English because I think in Hebrew as well, he was just kind of, 
reaching and grasping for, what do I tell them? Uh, uh, your servant? Yeah, yeah, that's me, your servant. Um, and I went, and, and when I, I didn't see, I saw some saying, I, I don't know what. I didn't, you know, and it's like David's finally saying, you know what, just be quiet. I don't understand the thing you're saying. Step aside. And you might wonder, well, does he, did he, is he lying to the king? He's definitely concealing some information. Because in verse 20, you know, Joab said pretty clearly, don't go to the king because the son of the king is dead. So it sounds as though uh, Ab- Ahimaaz knew this information. And when he's asked about it, he doesn't tell David the bad part <laughs> of the good news, right? He's got a good news message to bring, but he, he doesn't want to tell him the bad part. Um, Dale Ralph Davies wrote the commentary on 2 Samuel, and he wrote, Ahimaaz couldn't bring himself to tell David the bad news. He told David the truth, but he didn't tell him the whole truth. So David has to wait to get the message from somebody else. And thankfully, there's another messenger coming. So he tells Ahimaaz, step aside, wait here. Let's see what the Cushite has to say. And so in verse 31, the Cushite arrives, and he tells a message very similar to, to Ahimaaz's. And he he announces right at the beginning, it's good news. He uses that phrase, receive this good news. And the good news is that the Lord has freed you. And the word freed in Hebrew is shafat, which means judge or vindicated, right? The Lord has, has judged and vindicated, and as a result, you've been set free from all the power, the hand of those who rose up against you. Again, incredibly good news. This is sort of like, wow, God has been faithful and is being faithful to his promises. So is David able to hear the good news that God is bringing to him or through these messengers? No, he only can hear kind of what he's fixed on hearing. He only wants to know about his son, his boy, Absalom. So what about Absalom? I know a battle schmattle. What about the boy Absalom? And the Cushite, who doesn't necessarily feel burdened, you know, with any personal feelings for David or his family, just answers the question pretty plainly. Although, thankfully, he doesn't answer it quite so directly. He doesn't say, yeah, Absalom is dead. Maybe he knows as well. That's not the kind of wording you want to use for David. So he talks around that a little bit. And he says, let the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be as that young man. So he uses that word again, na'ar, but almost contemptuously. He almost spits it back. Oh yeah, that young man? Yeah. He, he gone. He's dead. And uh, he made it pretty clear to David now that, that his son is dead. Everybody should be who rises up against the Lord's anointed for evil. But again, that truth can't get through to David in this moment. It's amazing that in, of all the characters so far, whether it was Joab in figuring out who to send or the Cushite and, and Ahimaaz and how they conveyed the message, that it's only this extra, the Cushite, who delivers the truth, right? The critical news that is the whole truth, both the good news, which is the Lord has freed you this day, and the bad news. Well, in order to deliver you, the thing that you love the most had to die. It's interesting that this word is used basara or basar, the, the bringing of the good news over and over again. It's the same word that we use in the New Testament uh, when we use the word gospel. That comes from this word good news, which, uh, which we're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 that we are and we've been approved by God to be entrusted with what? With this good news, like these messengers he's given us this good news and made us good news bringers. We're mevasarim, good news bringers. What is that good news that we want to tell people? Well, and the good news that we need to receive as well is that God, even though our sin has separated us from God, even though there was nothing we could do that could redeem us from that curse, God alone provided what we could not, right? That's good news. He took upon himself the cost of our sin when the Messiah came and died in our place as a substitutionary atonement. And what's the response? We need to return. It's called shuv or teshuvah, to turn from our sin in repentance and put our trust in what Messiah has done for us so that we can receive 
forgiveness and new life from him. What, all that is really good news. What could be wrong with that? Well, it's because before we receive good news, we have to acknowledge the really hard news, the bad news, our sin and our sinfulness, our brokenness and our separation from God. And not only that, but once you realize the Messiah has paid the price to remove that, you have to be willing to separate yourself from your attachment to your sin, to your life that you knew before. Are we ready to do that? And as those who receive the good news, do we continue to let go of the thing we love the most? Well, we haven't gotten there yet. We're going to hear what David's response is to that in the next verses. How does he react when he hears what he didn't want to be? He, he wanted the good news to come in a certain way, and it came instead in this way. How does he respond? Well, with grief and with pain. And we see that starting in verse 33 of chapter 18. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said as he walked, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Even in the Hebrew as well as the English, this is just a a, a heaving sob of, of grief, uncontrolled pain. He's deeply moved, and, and uh, the, the Hebrew word is actually ragaz, which means to shiver or quake or tremble. That's how physically struck he was by this news, sobbing and crying over his loss, wishing he had died even in his son's place. So these are the words that, that come screaming out of this passage down again through the ages as, as people have written plays, Absalom, Absalom, and people have cried out and have seen in this the suffering and the anguish of a father for his son. Now, as a, as a bit of a side note, a sidebar, if you will, uh, this is one more event in the book of 2 Samuel that is a, uh, a reminder of David's lamentations. The book of 2 Samuel is filled with these moments where David grieves and David laments for people who have been lost. In chapter 1, he, he gret, cried out and gave a, a quite long lamentation over the death of Saul and Jonathan. And in chapter 3, he even gave a, a speech and a lamentation over the death of Abner, right, the general enemy that fought against him. In chapter 4, he laments the death of Ishbosheth, Saul's son who had risen up against him. And all of these are very proper and right, right? You, when you sort of uh, officially declare these beautiful poems that really let people know uh, that this was a person who died and it grieves me to say and to see it and we mourn over them, uh, David kind of sets up a pattern almost of just what it looks like to grieve in, in the right way, to respond to the loss of someone who is important. But then some other losses come along that change even David's way of grieving First of all, it was the death of his infant son in chapter 12. And this was a result of his sin, right? So, so things really shifted after chapter 11 and 12 uh, where he sinned against the Lord and God confronted him. And then God told him there would be a consequence to his sin found in chapter 12. So there's the death of his infant son, which he responds in a strange way, not in a traditional way of mourning, but he, he mourns when the baby is alive and he kind of cleans himself up after the baby's dead and says, well, what am I going to do? I can't go to him. Uh, he can't come back to me. I will go to him. But now we reach the death of his son, Absalom, and it's like he just loses all decorum, and he breaks down and cries. So it's kind of this journey through David's life as he grows, as he matures, as he grows in strength in, in his pol political career, but as well as his personal development and his journey of faith, his, his, his faith in the Lord, his sin against the Lord, his brokenness before the Lord. Uh, and in those stages of life, he definitely responds in different ways as he learns to depend desperately on God's mercy. So since that time of his own fall, you don't see David killing the messenger anymore. You see David 
reacting more internally. <laughs> the question is why, why what, what, what created this change? Well, I think in one sense, of course, it's the loss of his sons. Uh, it can be explained by his own personal deep paternal affection. Even if he wasn't always a great father, he, he felt it deeply. But there's also more under the surface. Uh, again, uh, going back to some of God's promises to David, I would turn to chapter 7, where God revealed all of his great promises to David in verse 14. where God says of his descendant that he would build a house for David. And he says in verse 14, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. But then he gives David a little bit of a built-in warning in this promise. And I will establish his throne, the throne of his kingdom. Sorry, dropping down. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and with the strokes of the son of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul whom I removed from before you. So there we see a promise with uh, a bit of a warning of what might happen, but does that negate the promise? The answer is no, God's promise is still God's promise. But then even after David turns and rebels against the Lord, spurns the Lord as God said in chapter 12, God responds. Starting in verse 10 there it says, Now therefore, God is saying to David, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own house. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing under, before all Israel, and under the sun. So now all of these pronouncements of God are coming to pass, and David, I think, realizes that he's, in in his own grief over his loss, realizes his own complicity in the guilt that led to God's righteous judgment because of his spurning the Lord in his sin. Right now he's seen the consequence, the death of his infant son, the death later of Amnon, his other son, the death of of Absalom and he even wishes that he could have died instead of him in in Absalom's place. Why? Again, Davis in his commentaries writes, because he knew that he deserved to die because of his sin. So David is feeling this grief and this sorrow over this greatest of losses and that, of course, grief and sorrow then has an impact on others around him. Now imagine Joab is coming back from the battle, right? In the next chapter, chapter 19, Joab's leading his troops back from, uh, from, the, from the forest to Machanaim, having defeated the enemy, having dispersed the enemy, victorious, saving the king who was in exile, only to get word through his, you know, sources that David, by the way, is not there to meet the army, but he's hiding in his room and he's weeping and he's mourning and he's grieving for the death of his son, for the death of the one you just defeated in order to save him. It's interesting that in his life, Absalom, in chapter 15, we're told that he stole the hearts of Israel, right? The Hebrew word to steal is ganav. If you've ever heard that phrase, a ganav is a, is a thief, right? Ganav means to steal. Absalom stole the hearts of the people Israel. And now even in his death, He's stealing something. He's stealing the joy of victory from the people of Israel because the people, as they come back, we're told, have to steal back into the city. And that same word, Hebrew word, ganav, is used for the way that they return. You know, instead of returning victorious, they feel more like they're deserters, returning in shame. Instead of coming in victory, they're coming in dishonor. And that's the way they approach the city in chapter 19. So Joab wants to do something about this. But we don't finish yet. <laughs> There's this re- the return of the troops is sort of bracketed on either side by this echo of David's mourning, right? We hear it again. Uh, 
verse 4, the king covered his face and cried out with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. It's as if this chant had just been on and going from before and during and after the, the return of the troops. That's all he was doing is just locking himself into his inner room and focusing inward on his pain and on his grief. How much time, you know, in our lives do we focus inward on our, on our p- pains and on our sorrows? Because not to delegitimize anybody's pain and sorrow, but what do we do and how to respond and what do we do with that grief and with that pain? How long before we turn our gaze back outward, first of all, to the Lord, and then to those who are waiting, you know, for us to help them, uh, who rely on us for their care? And in David's case, it's interesting, we're told over and over again in this passage, only one time is he, is he called David. Every other time he's called the king, All right? Because he has a role and a responsibility, and God has anointed him to be the shepherd of Israel. That's what God wants, has called him to be. That's God's promise for him. But in this moment, he can't see that. He's not responding to that. But he needs to come to this point, as Joab is about to tell him, that it's not just about you, and it's not even just about your pain, but it's about what you're supposed to be doing right now. Now, Again, I don't want to just walk past David in his pain and his sorrow. This is an important moment of, of, of loss for him, of anguish for him. And for those of us who are going through suffering and loss, it's not something to just you know, sh- uh, shrug at. It's interesting, though, as we, as we consider what David is suffering, to look again to the message of, of the gospel, right? The good news that of Yeshua the Messiah, and to consider what that good news entails. It entails his death for our sin. There's great loss uh, paid so that we could be set free, so that we could be delivered. And sometimes when we think about the gospel, you know, and we think about how Yeshua took our punishment. That's kind of looking at it from our perspective. Oh yeah, I had this sin. Jesus took it from me. Now I'm free. And that's a great way to, to remember what he did for us. Sometimes we look at the gospel from Yeshua's point of view. That is how he alone bore our sin. You know, he walked that path. He hung on that cross and he cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? as he echoed the words of Psalm 22. What's interesting is uh, my mind is brought to the song this week, How Deep the Father's Love for Us by uh, Stuart Townend. And he he talks about how he wrote that song, realizing there's different ways to contemplate Messiah and what he suffered for us. But how how often do we think about the cost it, it was to the Father, that his son, his only son, who was sent for us, would die at such a painful sacrifice. And so here we hear that in David's cry, we can imagine God's cry uh, when his son gave his life for us. In fact, when my, my Jewish mother, Lucy, was, uh, before she was a believer in, in Jesus, thank the Lord now, she is a believer in Messiah, but when she was working at her job and a woman came to her who was writing a paper at college about how different cultures grieve and mourn when people die, She said to my mom, look, you're Jewish. How do Jewish people grieve and mourn for people's loss? And my mom was going through the traditions, you know. Well, we we sit shiva for seven days. We we just remember and we grieve and we let people come and bring us food. But also upon the death of a loved one, in ancient times in the Bible, people would just tear their clothes, right? Rend their garments. Uh, Maybe in uh, later days, you know, this past century, we would just tear the lapel of the coat is a sign to others that we were in mourning. Today, we don't want to destroy our garments anymore, so we just pin a black cloth onto the lapel, and we just tear the cloth, and that's easier. Uh, but it's a sign, a symbol for others that we're in mourning. So it all goes back to that, that tearing of the cloth. And as my mother is explaining this to this person at her job, she kind of has a moment where she says, you know, when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom as if, as if God himself were tearing the covering of his garments. Now, I'm not saying that's the actual interpretation of what happened, but it was interesting that my mom should uh, see that as she considered 
God's mourning of the death of his son in that moment, um, his grief. And yet, we'll see later on, there was a reason and a purpose even for that, for what he suffered. Is there a reason and a purpose in this for David? Well, Joab has a word for David. I don't know if it's the final answer, but he needs him to get up and get out of his, his, his inner grief and pain. Again, because that's all David is able to fix himself in. He's just wrapped up and entangled in his grief. So Joab says, somebody's got to do something. He goes ahead to David and he gives him a very, very rough speech. All right? In fact, the first words he says to David in verse 5, Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, Today you have covered with shame the faces of all your servants. And the, the word at the beginning of the Hebrew sentence is just the word shame. I mean, boom, he's going to hit David hard. He's not going to be gentle with this speech. He's not going to leave, uh, you know, anything kind of soft. He's, he's going to go right at it. Just as if to say, you've got to stop it. Snap out of it. We don't have time for this, right? And be, his message, however, isn't quite that brief. He goes on for 75 words to, to tell David what he needs to do. What's interesting is, uh, that's not only the longest speech ever given by Joab in this passage. It's apparently the longest speech in all of First or Second Samuel. It's this one here by Joab, aimed at King David. And it's the only time Joab confronts David directly in this way, right? Other times he'll send in uh, like a woman from Tekoa with a, with a bit of a parable or, or, or send a messenger with a veiled message. But here he's just right in David's face. And again, his opening words, shame. Do you get it, David? Do you hear it? Do you hear what I'm saying? You need a rude awakening because you've covered in shame, even as you've covered your own face, you're really covering your people. The people in your life who, by the way, have done everything for you, and yet you're covering them with shame. So this is definitely a t- one of those tough love speeches. You don't want to always have to give these kind of messages, but he does here, speaking the truth in love. Is it the truth? You could read this and realize, well, Joab stretches the truth a little bit here, right? When he says, you love those that hate you and you hate those that love you. I mean, David doesn't, but it's coming across that way. And I think he needs to, for the shock value, to the shock of David's system, he needs to say something that's going to shock him out of his, uh, his grief and bring him back to the here and now, as he says over and over in the speech, this day, today, this day, get back to reality. And be aware of what's going on. In verse 6, as he says, by those uh, loving those who hate you, hating those who love you, he goes into a series of, of, of reasons. He says, for you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day. And he, that word in Hebrew is key. Okay? So like six or, or so times here, maybe five times, he uses that word in this one sentence, like, key, 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 key. It sounds like a machine gun of accusations at David to just blast him out of his seat. Even to say, do you really rather see all of us dead and Absalom alive? I mean, earlier, the soldiers had said, that very thing. If we all die, they don't care. They're going to only come after you. And in this case, it's almost as if David's saying, if you all die, I don't care. At least that's what Joab is trying to help him realize. That's the way that his uh, response to this message has affected others. So he has a cure to this in verse 7. Now, therefore. So ve'ata, now. Okay? That was then. This is now. <laughs> this is what you need to do. Snap out of it. Right? Snap out of what could happen or what may have happened, but get to what's happening now. And here's what you must do. Uh, Get up and get out. Uh, These are very short, brief, direct imperatives in the Hebrew. Kum, tse, get up, get out. (laughs) In fact, one of the commentators calls these two whiplash imperatives. You better do this right now. And then he follows that with the word daber, speak. So get up, get out, and do what? Speak. We read in the English, speak kindly to your men. But in the Hebrew, it's speak to the heart of your servants. That's what David needs to do. He needs to speak to their heart. Um, 
For good measure, David, uh, Joab does follow up with a couple of keys again, a couple of threatening shots at him. Because if you don't, I swear, and he tells him what the warnings are, right? He says, for if you, for I swear by the Lord, verse 7, if you do not go out, surely not a man will pass this night with you, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. So this is maybe a warning. Coming from Joab, maybe a threat, right? You better do this or I'm going to make sure your life is in trouble. And that's saying a lot because David's had a lot of troubles all of his life. And God has delivered them from all of them. But Joab's saying this moment is, this is it. This is the real deciding crisis in your life. How are you going to respond to this? Because essentially everything good in your life up till now, if you don't, Do the right thing right now. You'll lose it all. Do you really want to do that now? One of my favorite uh, lines in in one of my favorite Bob Dylan songs, and that's saying a lot, is uh, a line where he says, when you think that you've lost everything, you find out you can always lose a little more. Uh, David has lost everything, he feels, and Joab's saying, no, no, no. You could lose a lot more. In this moment, even of your greatest loss, David is being told, you need to let go of that. Let go of a little bit more. When it feels like there's nothing more you can lose, that's when you need to be ready to actually let go, release your grip on whatever it is you're clinging to. What are you clinging to when you've lost everything? Are you clinging to yourself, to your life? Are you just self-focused? Are you clinging to your loss? Are you clinging to your grief? Are you wrapping that around yourself like a cloth and that becomes your identity? We're being told here you have to let go if you want to hold on. If you want to receive God's promises, you still have to keep letting go. It's not easy. It's not a little unlike Eustace who had to let Aslan tear that dragon skin off of him. I'm sure he'd grown attached to it, but it was time to let it be taken away. We have to let go every day as well. In Luke chapter, tw- chapter 9, Yeshua tells us this. In verse 23, he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me, giving up your life every day. It has to happen over and over again. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what does a man profit it if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Do you really want to lose that? No, but lose what you're holding on to, even if it is painful, even if it's your pain. So how does David respond to this? Well, he doesn't exactly get up and get out like Joab told him. He does get up, we read in verse 8. So the king arose, and he sat back down again. He sat in in the gate. At least he's sitting now in the right place. And he went out. He didn't speak to the hearts of his people. He just went out, okay? He can only do what he can manage to do, but his people came to him. And he's back where the king is supposed to be. The king sits in the gate to judge and to rule and to, and to make decisions and to, so the people can see him and know that he's reigning there. And David takes his place. So I think we come to the point where we have to ask If we've received the good news, have we received it fully? Or are we sort of stalling at the, wait a minute, that doesn't sound good. That sounds bad. You're telling me i got to give up? i got to let go? I have to give up my life to receive this promise of God? David, I think, was clinging to maybe what he hoped would be the fulfillment of God's promises in Absalom. Even though it looked terrible, he thought, well, he's the one. He's my son. And, and God is saying, just keep trusting me, let go. 
turns out that even in this loss and even in this judgment of David's sin and against Absalom himself, none of this was going to get in the way of God fulfilling his promises for David because God would ultimately send the greatest son of David who would reign, who would sit on his throne forever. The sword never departed from the house of David. In fact, it even pierced that son, didn't it? Uh, But it was for a purpose. Turns out it was not only part of God's punishment, it was part of God's promise was that piercing of the pierced one, our Messiah. So there's a purpose, even in what seems to be a loss for us. There's a greater reward, right? And the greater reward is the unfathomable joy that God has in store for us, but we sometimes can't see it through our, the thing that we're holding on to or through the, even through our tears. But that joy is coming. It's that glorious presence of God, that hope that he is not only with us when we give up our lives and receive what he has for us, but when we know we're going to stand with him in his kingdom, we're going to look upon him. That was the joy that, that Yeshua looked forward to as he bore his death. In Hebrews chapter 12, we fix our eyes on Yeshua, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we can endure the pain as we fix our eyes on him and as we look forward to that great joy that he has for us as well. David has to get there, but God is going to fulfill his promises for him, and we know that we can hold on to God's promises as well. Let's pray. Lord, we do lift up our hearts to you, and we do thank you for this word that reminds us of the, the difficulty it can be. It's not easy to lose your life or lose the life of, of what is so dear to us. But Lord, we hope that and know and trust that we can let go of anything that holds us back from your true promise for us. And God, you do have good and, and blessings and promise in store for us, Lord, so we look to that. Uh, Help us not to fixate on what we thought would be your promise, but rather to keep our eyes open and keep ourselves surrendered to you. Uh, To hear that good news, Lord, that there is good news. Yes, it includes sometimes bad news of what uh, comes with it, that our sin has gotten in the way of your love, Lord. Thank you for the good news that you took our sin upon yourself to remove that separation, to bring us to yourself that we need to continue to be reminded of that every day uh, to to, uh, enter into your promises, to live in those promises. Again, we thank you for your word. In the name of Yeshua, amen.